Business, Australia's business channel. The information featured in this program is general in nature and therefore should not be relied upon. Guests appearing on the program may have commercial arrangements with some of the companies mentioned. Before making any investment, insurance or financial planning decisions, you should consult a licensed professional who can advise whether your decision is appropriate for you. Thank you for joining me again this evening. You've tuned in to Your Money, Your Call, and we're all ready to deliver your weekly dose of property information and education. But before I introduce you to my guests this evening, let's take a look at a couple of news headlines. And according to a Genworth survey, consumers and industry professionals rate Australia's mortgage market positively. However, the survey did point to declining first home buyer loans. While the overall health of the market was seen as good, the survey suggested that first home buyers comprise 10.5% of all lender originated loans and 18.9% of all broker originated loans, which Genworth claims supports arguments that this group is finding it increasingly difficult to enter the housing market. The Genworth survey also suggested first home buyers are almost twice as likely than other borrowers to use an intermediary like a broker rather than directly approaching the lender. And the Reserve Bank of Australia Governor Glenn Stevens expects interest rates can remain low for some time yet, as long as pockets of potential over-exuberance and over-excitement remain in check. He said that the need for stronger growth outside the resources sector justifies the present low interest rate settings and that inflation is well under control and is likely to remain so over the next couple of years. Stevens also said that in such circumstances monetary policy should be accommodative and on present indications is likely to be that way for some time yet. Now tonight we're talking depreciation, property investing and if you have specific Perth questions, that too. And to help out tonight, I've asked regular experts Brad Beer from BMT and Damien Collins from Momentum Wealth into the studio. Now if you have a question for anyone on the panel this evening, don't wait. Call us right now on 13 1330-3435 or email your questions to me now at property at skynews.com.au. Welcome to the program tonight and let's get started. I'm a little bit worried, you two, about all of this talk about first home buyers being priced out of the market and not being in the market. I don't know about you two, but what I'm actually seeing happening is there's a whole new type of borrower emerging. Mm -hmm. And today I coined a phrase for it called the first home investor, mm -hmm. which is actually those first home buyers who are by choice choosing to continue to rent where they want to live and becoming an investor by just buying into the market. Yeah, Damien. Absolutely. Look, I think uh, we see a lot of our clients too uh, who don't own a home, They're particularly the mining guys over in Perth who fly and fly out, rent where they want to live and buy an investment property and at some stage they, that's, they may live in it or they may not. They don't really care as long as they've got their foothold in the market. So I agree with you, it's certainly a, a trend we're seeing. Uh, look, the first home buyers, it, it varies around the country. I know Sydney's quite low on first home buyers at the moment, but some of the other states aren't quite as bad as some of those figures were suggesting. Mm. Can I also point out that even the Reserve Bank has admitted that the way they're measuring numbers of first home buyers is through first home owner grants. Mm. And in most states of Australia now, first home owner grants only go to people who choose to build or buy a brand new home. And it doesn't take into account all those first home buyers who are actually buying an established property. Mm. They're not even getting counted in that mix. Yeah, exactly. And, in, and in, for example, in Western Australia, it's, it's $3,000 for established home and for a lot of people... Uh, they just don't even bother with it because it's so low. So yeah, I agree exactly. Mm. That's that's an impact. Brad, um, it is interesting though, isn't it? Because I know that uh, people say of my kids' age, who are you know in their late twenties, they these days for them, it's not such a need to have a place to call your own any longer. I guess if you think about how they've been raised, they've been raised in a disposable society where everything happens really quickly. So they actually probably choose not to anchor themselves somewhere. They don't want to be locked in. And this is why they're becoming investors first. 
And I think, you know, disposable society and, and probably ease of credit is another reason. And, and you, we end up probably, you know, th that age, we probably go and buy a big television where back, you know, 40 years ago, we probably saved a lot of money and had a little small television until mm. that time that came or about. Or no television or no 40 television. years ago. Uh, <laughs> and, and I think that, that, that a lot of first home or potential first home buyers that can't afford to get into the market probably want to live... You know, we've had rising prices in our country in so many places and, you know, sometimes you've got to get a bit, of fur a bit further out of town or buy a house that needs some renovation to be able to afford to buy it. Mm. And I even look at, look, and, and we have, it's 190 people at BMT and, and I've got a lot of young people that are buying first homes and they're going out and they're buying, you know, often new homes and building new homes in areas that are a bit wider out because they want a nice new home. Mm. I didn't do that. Our parents didn't do that. They bought something that needed work, I suppose. Mm. So the mentality of wanting something that's new and moving further out to try and get that is something that seems to be part of that same sort of mm. society. And sometimes I think um, I agree with you on the on the investor instead quite regularly because we see them buying depreciation schedules to mm. start with. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm not against that because as long as you're still getting into that market and buying... And, and learning how to invest in property to make money, you've still got opportunity later potentially if you get a number of properties to buy that property that you do want to want to live in in that area and, and I'm still a renter myself, mm. have been for many years. Look, I agree entirely and, and Damien, I don't know about you and I'm sure your company is the same as mine, a significant proportion of our clientele, apart from the fact that we do have a big proportion in that 40 plus where they're mm. starting to see that they need to prepare for retirement, but a significant emerging proportion of our clientele are these young couples mm. who have got good jobs and two solid incomes and they're not looking to put the money into their own home they're looking to start and build a really strong portfolio of properties before they get into having a family and doing things like that and so they're quite happily renting wherever they want to live or renting near where their jobs exist yeah. so they can keep earning that big money but they're building portfolios well, exactly, and I think it's also because they're often getting married later, having the kids later, there's, there's not that in, impetus to actually get into the market and buy a home to live in. They definitely want to get in and buy an investment property, but as you say, going back 40 years when people were married in their early or mid-20s and had kids very quickly, it was a different life cycle. Now when people are often having kids well into their 30s, getting married at that, that date, that's when that, that thought about actually a secure, stable home where they want to be uh, for longer term. But yeah, definitely in their 20s and 30s, they're getting into the market investment but living where they want to. And it's an important discussion to have because I think the media and the government reports, oh no, oh no, we have this situation where the reason first home buyers aren't active is because they can't afford to be. And I think it's not telling the right story. I think it's a it's a false representation of what's really happening out there. Well, typically, and also in, even in the major cities in Sydney and Melbourne as well, if you go out to the, you know, you've got to go a long way out, but you can still buy houses, you know, certain that four and 500,000. So it's just a choice. People want that lifestyle choice and mm. rather rent in different locations. Absolutely. So it probably Probably good for them to do some sort of study that that actually compared those numbers to mm. the, you know, and and the trend or change in first time investors or whatever your new name was for them yes. that, that haven't bought a house yet. Now, we don't always know. See, we don't know when someone buys a schedule from us whether or not they've bought their own house because we don't necessarily ask that question. But if they could pull that data and said and compare the trend between the two, that'd be probably more relevant. Well, I'd be curious to see what the data is on. We, we know how many people get investor loans because that's actually reported. So let's then have a look and see how many of those people who get a, investor loans have no other property and are getting this as their first property. So mm. they're, they're, they're still first property buyers, they're just not first home buyers. And that would be an interesting statistic to see. Mm. Maybe that's something that we can commission maybe we can commission a I don't know, you commission the study, but I'm it's sure bank, we can. The banks. I'm sure it. we can. You're one of the banks <laughs> to commission that study. Many banks are watching tonight. Maybe you can commission that study. Look in our first email tonight. Jason raises some really interesting points, and he says, "I love the show. That's an interesting point and a valid one too." I wanted to get your thoughts about the Sydney market and how prices will continue to grow. I've recently read an article that stated the average median house price in 2024 is tipped to hit 182. Two, four million. How can prices in Sydney and Melbourne continue to grow over the next few years if wages aren't increasing at the same rate? Even at a more modest 5% growth rate per year over the next 10 years, that would make houses even more unaffordable for the average person living in Sydney. I wanted to read this email out um, 
Damien, because you've got personal experience from living in Perth and we actually saw what happened when you had an impossibly hot market mm. where every property pretty well doubled, some did more mm. than doubling and that was about eight years ago now. Um, and then it sat flat and did nothing essentially for eight years and in fact some of those areas came back and lost up to 20% in value and it was all about the fact that this very thing happened the wages weren't keeping pace and people yeah. simply couldn't afford to buy yeah. there's no way the Sydney probably pr average price is going to be 1.8 million because we will see a significant period of flat exactly. won't we? Exactly look it's just not possible I mean prices ultimately go up in line with wages and uh, with a wage is going up at three or four um, percent in a city there's a population growth you might get a little bit more than that uh, and then within that pockets perhaps some individual properties and suburbs you might get a little bit more than that but the average property is more than likely to do maybe four to five percent and whenever you have that run up people think it's going to go on forever we saw it in Perth it was fantastic while it was there but in 2007 it, it stopped and a lot of properties actually as you mentioned before are still worth less than they were in 2007 even um, typical properties are only up maybe 10 or 15 percent in that now but having said that there are also some properties up 40 50 percent so in a flat market you can still select well and mm. still get property um, growth but you won't get you know, you know certainly very strong growth but you can certainly get performance mm. out that beats the market but well you know my properties are still up by a hundred percent it didn't re they lost a little bit of value yeah. those ones in Perth, but not much but then they came in from a very very low base of yep. 120,000 each and they're typically the kind that will hold their value in a market like that yeah. um, Brad I guess the important thing about thinking about all of this is that if you're prepared to be almost like a um, you know like a, a property speculator but um, someone who strictly try, tries to time all the markets you'd need to basically get in and get out of a market right in that peak period when it goes up in value a lot of these Sydney buyers have got in early enough got some good value but that money will have a, almost a diminishing return if the market stays flat now and they need to be doing that again and again. The average person needs to, to realise that any market over a 10 to 15 year period, most likely, as long as those fundamentals are in that market, is only going to grow by the same amount anyway, like because it is wages linked. Well, yeah, it's wages linked. Uh, effectively, someone has to either pay the rent or the interest uh, on, on all these properties. And if they overcook, unless we open up to a, you know, a, a massively increased amount of immigration or something, that means we have a lot more people coming that have got a lot of money to pay these, then eventually either the investor stops investing or the buyer can't afford to pay for it. Yeah. So there's got to be some sort of equilibrium as to where that's going to um, get. Now when it overcooks for a period of time, it usually flattens out and if we look at history for longer, we find that we end up with growth over time. Uh, and you know things things do grow over time but then if they cook too much and we unfortunately in this country tend to follow the herd and everybody gets I've made I'm making lots of money lots of money so we all keep buying there and when that starts happening you've got to stop buying before yes. it all keeps going it, exactly. on in that area and look for somewhere else where the herd isn't yeah and it really it really does Damien doesn't it come back to the fundamentals that if you're going to be an investor where you're actually acquiring a property portfolio to provide you with some kind of stability and net worth in retirement mm. then you have have to get in at some stage preferably not after everyone else has already gotten in and just hold and in that period of time you can expect that there'll be one period of great growth one period of flat growth mm. and then probably several periods of just your normal everyday growth and overall it all pretty well comes out the same yeah, everywhere. <laughs> exactly. I mean certainly you don't want to buy at the top of the boom because that's where you're going to have the, the longest period of, of a flat time but but exactly right over the longer term if you buy well uh, but it's all about selection I think mm. the, the market going forward is so much about selection not about the whole market yeah. going up and the, and the fundamentals isn't it the fundamentals have to be in those areas. Yeah and I th look I think speculation is difficult probably unless you get it right every yeah. time and sometimes yeah. you're going to get a little bit wrong. Yes. Um, buying it with some uh, ability to sell out with the costs associated with that unless you can get it right at the right time and time things that you can't control is quite a difficult thing to do uh, because of the cost in and out and because of the, the capital the non, gains tax yeah and, and the liquidity or the lack of liquidity I suppose that property sometimes has and the speed of being able to do transactions so you've got to get it right 
or be a long-term investor like most people that make money are so that you'll have fast, slow equilibrium and over the, over the period of time exactly. you end up um, increasing the wealth is the plan. Yep, so it's, there's no quick fix with property. Well, I'm glad that you joined us this evening. As you know, every Monday night, the panel and I will choose a question from either the emails or the calls and send a copy of one of my books. Well, this week, every question asked and answered on the show will receive my ebook, How to Achieve Success in Property Negotiations. Now, this is a must-have if you're ready to buy because it can save you thousands of dollars going into a property. Call us right now on 1300 30 34 35 or email property at skynews.com.au with a question and then if we read it out on the show you will receive the book. We're off for a few important messages. Don't go away when we come back. We'll take some more calls and we'll also answer some more emails. Well, it's good to have your company tonight. And for those just tuning in tonight, I'm joined by Brad Beer from BMT and Damien Collins from Momentum Wealth. And we're here to make sure that you get the answers that you need. Now, if you have a question, grab the phone, call us now on 1300 30 34 35, or email us on property at skynews.com.au. And remember, every caller or email answered on the show tonight will receive my ebook, How to Achieve Success in Property Negotiations. Richard from Sydney, how are you going, Richard? Hi, how are you, Margaret? Good, thank you. Uh, look, I just thought I'd uh, bring up, you know, you're talking renting versus buying. I saw a really quite a good chart um, about a week ago. Now, starting in 1992, if you draw a line up to uh, first-time buyers at around 55%, that's where they were then. Now, draw a line all the way down to 2014, straight down to the uh, bottom right, you will get to 5% for first-time buyers. Now, take the uh, uh, investor class, it's around about 4% in 1992, draw a line straight up 45 degrees till now and you'll get to 55%. I suppose, like you were saying, it may be uh, possibly uh, first-time buyers becoming investors, but secondly, the, 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 the Murray report will be coming out, David Murray's uh, report to the government will be coming out at the end of this week, and I mean, it makes really good reading if you get the Financial Review Today page, uh, page uh, number f f uh, 30, James Eyes does quite a good uh, expose on it, and basically what he will be saying is that uh, Murray's expected to highlight the distortions the tax regime has treated by encouraging Australians to borrow to buy property, and uh, the highly leveraged household sector overweight property and a banking sector overweight mortgages. These will be issues that will have to be tackled by the government's tax white paper next year. Just uh, comments on that, Margaret. Um, what do you think? Okay, so there's a question in there somewhere. Uh, did either of you pick it up? I think I did, uh, Richard. Uh, you mentioned uh, obviously that at the moment there's maybe a bit more of an, uh, a bias towards investors rather than uh, than owner occupiers. Look, the market does go in cycles. We've already chatted tonight about uh, why uh, there is potentially a lot more people actually investing first before they're buying. So, look, the market comes out in equilibrium eventually. If, if prices get too high, and investors don't get the rental returns, they'll start to pull back, and you'll see more home buyers come into the market. So, I just think that's a cyclical nature. Um, also, I, one thing the bigger cities, if you look around the world, um, the larger cities, there tends to be more people renting. Uh, if you look at New York and some of the European cities mm. as well. So I'd expect we'd see s some more of that. Um, you know, in the bigger cities, you'll, you'll probably see more uh, renters than actual people uh, buying. Uh, in terms of the Murray report, I did read the Finn on the plane over this morning. Uh, and look, he has uh, commented on uh, on certain aspects. And look, negative gearing is the old chestnut. It comes around, goes around. End of the day, you can negatively gear shares. You can negatively gear a business. When you set up a business, you can claim your losses carry forward. Uh, I just don't see the government doing anything politically. There's 1.5 million investors and it'd be very brave to touch that. Mm. And Brad, I wonder what would happen if suddenly the government said that in addition to uh, abolishing negative gearing, they're going to stop businesses from being able to carry forward or claim any losses that they're making as well. Then suddenly we'd have no businesses and then if they did the same to the share investors, we'd have no share investors. I think a lot of people do fail to see that when you invest in property, it's another business, I guess. People are in the business almost of investing in property certainly at least they're trying to do something for their future they're trying to reduce that burden of welfare off the government um, the other thing about this whole negative gearing thing that I get 
so angry about that people fail to see is that if you have a look and I've certainly studied most of our clients and their financial circumstances most people are only in a negatively geared situation for the first couple of years of investing and then they switch into a tax payable situation and I'd love to see those figures how much tax is paid by the people who are past those early years and are now contributing back and we never see it, seem to see those numbers, mm. I and, suppose. And definitely. they wouldn't have done it if they couldn't have gotten that bit of negative gearing in the beginning. Yeah. And it's not like you can re... The, I mean, the, when you think about the rules, re-borrowing against that investment property again is something you can't make deductions against that additional borrowings against the value of that property later on because it's no longer deductible debt. So that's, I guess, set up to make sure that we can't keep debting up and making deductions for those loss unless it's used for business purposes, which are always deductible a bit. Even as an, as an employee, you get to deduct things that are required to mm. do, your, your, um, do your job sometimes, and there's a list of those and that happens. Mm. You're still taking some risks as an investor, even though you get to make some tax deductions, there's still a risk associated with investing into property. You're still liable for the debt. You've got to be able to sleep with debt, which not everybody can, mm. um, so there's a risk there. And, and what do we do it for at the end of the day? Because we, we do it some... not because we're trying to make ourselves into these impossible multi-millionaires. We're basically just trying to make the future better mm. and have less reliance on an age pension that we can't rely on now. Yeah. And if you get it wrong, you, you, you lose money. It can money. go badly. Can <laughs> Leverage go goes the other way. <laughs> exactly. And there's no bailing out once that happens. Well, we know they tried it once before. And, and negative gearing is a rent subsidy. Uh, all this talk that it forces up property prices, I just don't believe it. When you look around, if it was that good, then everyone would actually rent and not buy a house. But we still have a high home ownership rate. End of the day, it's a rent subsidy, and if you take it away, investors all just want higher rents before they'll justify investing. Yeah, look, I think it's a whole can of worms that we probably shouldn't be opening up, but it's certainly a lot to think about. Thank you for your call, Richard. Sue from Melbourne, how are you going, Sue? Oh, good, thanks, Margaret. What can we do for you? Oh, can you please tell me, um, what, how would you negotiate the best price for a property, please? Um, now, Sue, you do have a, a radio or a television on in the background, so we didn't get that. Sorry. Yep, yep, yep. Okay, yep. Okay, so now can you ask your question again? Um, how do I negotiate the best price for a property? Oh, okay. Well, I think Sue's called on the right night. She's going to be getting a copy of my book, um, <laughs> How to Succeed in Property Negotiations. But let's give her a couple of tips now. Sue, I'm sure a lot of the answers are in Margaret's book. All of the answers are in Margaret's book. But uh, a couple of things I like to do is um, find out a lot of the circumstances around the seller and why they're selling. So uh, uh, I'd want to know how much they paid for it, uh, how long ago they bought it, ask the agent lots and lots of questions about why are they selling uh, and start to dig down and often the selling agents will give you lots of information perhaps some information they shouldn't and also motivation so why are they are they bought have they bought elsewhere do they need a specific settlement date so you can ask some some other questions that aren't as specific but you might get some good answers as well so it really comes down to a lots and lots of questioning ultimately uh, you it's hard to um, uh, if you tailor a, a solution to uh, that'll meet the sellers needs and expectations you might find they might drop another five or ten thousand off so yeah ask lots of questions to get to find out what the circumstances are brad you've probably got some sneaky little tricks what are some of those <laughs> look i think finding out as much about the motivation for sale how keen do they need to get rid of it is it a situation where you've got that ability i think a big thing for me is not getting attached and even if you are attached not looking attached so if you're buying your own home i think uh, very different because you've got to try not to look attached but look excited about buying this great kitchen. Um, the kitchen's never that great when you're the <laughs> buyer <laughs> or there's something that, you know, things that need fixing and you need to not ever sort of give away how keen you are and be prepared to walk away. I've always put offers in with time frames um, and I'm looking at another property and usually I am at the same time and at four o'clock I'm, I'm a buyer that's gone. Um, effectively and often that'll help get you across the line by making and make a decision. Mm. And Sue, look, just um, to add to all of that, one of the most important things about negotiating is that you maintain the power and I'm pretty sure that that's what Brad is saying. The power is in your court. One of the ways I do that is to make sure that whenever I'm buying a property I have three or four that I'm interested in. I can start the negotiations with all of them. I don't become attached to any of them. It means I move more slowly. The vendors tend to move more quickly than 
than I do. It gives me the power and it means that I can stick to my price and not move. And by having that power in my court, I've always found that I've quite successfully negotiated um, properties much further down than people would ever think that I could. Well, this is Your Money, Your Call, and we're having a great night, but we do need to take a break. It won't take long, so stay tuned and perhaps even call us now on 1330 3435 or email us on property at skynews.com.au. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the program. If you have a question that you would like answered, call us now on 1330 3435 or email your money at sky, no, sorry, property at skynews.com.au. That's what happens when you just randomly read and you don't pay attention to what you're reading. Welcome to the program, Anthony. You're from Sydney. Oh, How are you going? I'm well, thank you. Okay, um, good for you. I've got a question about Brisbane. Um, and greater area and I've got to make a decision as to whether to buy um, for say $300,000 in the Logan Shire area or instead spend say $450,000 in the Runcorn area and I, I understand the big price difference and I, I can't afford the difference I can't afford the fact that the rent in Runcorn the yield would be lower than the rent in Logan Shire so mm. I guess my question is um, you know, am I going to get better long-run capital growth out of um, being closer to the to Brisbane CBD and run corn compared to Logan Shire? Mm. Okay. Now let's just put all this into perspective. For starters, uh, I guess it's really important to help everyone to realise that the more you pay doesn't necessarily mean the better return you're going to get or even a, a better investment over long term. So that's important to know. Runcorn isn't that far away from Logan. In fact, it's d almost due north, a little bit northwestish, on the run up into Brisbane. Um, there's a significant number of townhouses there, but also some ha houses as well, a little bit more established than Logan and always been thought to be a better suburb. But $150,000 better mm. and you're going to get a lower return? Not sure. Yeah, that does seem like a, like a big difference there, Anthony. Uh, I guess you've got to go back to your, your fundamentals and what's the infrastructure you're looking at in those two particular areas? Uh, is there good transport? Uh, is there population demand? Is there employment centres? All the fundamentals and then weigh it up, relative, weigh it up relatively and look at 150,000, 450 to 300 does seem a big difference for areas that aren't particularly that far away from each other. Mm. What do you think, Brett? 450 and 300 when they're not very far away, it's 50% 50 more. 50% more. So, yeah, look, so the, the fact is we don't have a crystal ball on growth between the two, but I, I believe generally they tend to grow in some sort of, um, you know, if you think it's going to, if Runcorn's going to grow better, then someone who can't afford the 450 is probably going to live if it's fairly close in the 300 eventually. Mm -hmm. um, and the 300 generally as a percentage perform fairly similarly and sometimes better than, mm -hmm. than uh, than probably the more expensive property. You're opening yourself up to more people with cheaper property. I've got a lot of cheaper property. I've got property in the Logan, in the Logan area. But uh, I, I, sometimes I guess it's a risk versus return thing. With a higher number going in, there's a little bit more risk attached because it's a higher number. Um, sometimes I guess the, the, the Logan sometimes just is less risky and you've got a better return and it's not costing you so much to hold it on the way through. Sometimes there's a better situation. Yeah, and I think that's the important thing to point out, Anthony. There's not a big difference in the position of Runcorn versus uh, Logan. And at the moment, it's the sentiment of the people buying which is making Runcorn more expensive. It's the old adage of, you know, people buying there because they think it's a better suburb. They'll pay more to get into what they perceive as being a better suburb. But over time, and certainly over your investing lifetime, the differences between the two will gradually change. Runcorn's already had some good growth, and that's behind it now. Logan's on the catch-up phase, and while Logan will always be worth less than Runcorn, I don't believe the big difference will always exist. And I'm pretty sure you'll find that that gap will close fairly quickly. In the meantime, as the panel has pointed out, you're going to be getting a better return and you're also going to be able to buy more of those kinds of properties in Logan than you can with the Runcorn one. You might be able to buy one Runcorn one, maybe one and a half to two of the Logan ones or Logan type properties and get a better spread in that market. I just don't see a significant enough difference and a significantly better investment to make paying 
50% more worthwhile. If it was only 30 or 40 thousand dollars more, it might be a different story. That I guess the panel's all in agreement there that possibly the Logan One might have better growth potential for you over time. Well, Peter from Sydney, how are you going, Peter? Evening. Thank you very much for taking my call. I have a question in relation to the inner west of Sydney. Mm -hmm. um, I recently went to a seminar and the uh, person who was conducting the seminar said that the, the key criteria to investing in, in uh, certain suburbs of Sydney would be close to shops and transport and, uh, and, and good transport and, um, and uh, private schools, etc. And I'm just trying to find out from the panel whether they can see any specific, uh, I've got uh, my mind set on certain suburbs like Marrickville and Elwood as potential uh, hotspots of the inner west that still have got potential to grow further. What's the panel's view on those uh, particular suburbs? Okay, Brad. I think the, the fundamentals firstly, transport, shops, schools, wherever you are, they are the, the things that are going to drive, or they're, they're fundamental reasons why we invest in certain properties in certain areas because that's the reasons people want to live there and create more demand for those areas. As far as Maracle Earl, what I, I know the, the big plan along Parramatta Road was a big, and I've seen this earlier this week, was a, a large, or well, might have been last week, um, a, a large amount of investment with lots of units along that Parramatta Road area, which is not quite in those areas we're talking about. Um, the buy-in price in Marrickville and Earlwood's pretty high um, in comparison to a lot of areas, and, we've, and it's had some growth, I would, would have expected, over the last little while, like a lot of in a west or western Sydney suburbs have. So you're at a higher risk and a higher price, I suppose, mm. to start with. So it depends where you are in your investing journey, I suppose, is my answer to that. And, and it might be one you want to have, but it, um, it might be a lot of risk depending on what it looks like for you, I suppose, as well. Um, Damien, one of the things that I really like investors to try to get a handle over is the fact that when we recommend that you shouldn't be buying in an area or you might be too late to buy in an area, we're not saying it's a bad area to invest in. Mm. What we're saying is that its capacity to deliver a really substantial period of growth to you is probably now behind you. Yeah. I think when an area becomes what we fondly call blue chip, it's because it used to not be blue chip. Exactly. It might have been a bit dodgy even. Mm -hmm. It's become blue chip. And anyone who invested back then made a good amount of money out of it. But if you buy there now, there's only so much more it can grow. Exactly. And I think really an investor's best uh, possible method is if they can find those areas that potentially could be blue chip in the area that haven't had that big period of growth yet and get in before it does. Exactly. And that's our, look, that's our investment philosophy as well. It's, it's by the value suburbs that the market hasn't recognised yet uh, as those blue chip suburbs or highly desirable, but all those fundamental things that will make it eventually. And that's how you make the money in property, choosing the areas that not everyone else recognises. And when the market re-rates it, that's how you get that market outperformance. So in, uh, in Peter's case here, obviously we think the Sydney market, I think it's pretty much consensus, Sydney market's topped out and not going to have a lot of growth so if you want to get any property capital gains in Sydney in the next couple of years you've got to be really choosing wisely and obviously Brad mentioned there's some things happening along Parramatta Road out there. Another thing for him to think about is supply. Uh, yes all those factors that were mentioned are important uh, transport, shops, schools etc but I'm always very cautious about supply if there's areas where a lot of apartments or a lot of other products are going to come on that can hold back price growth. And these areas are those areas where we are seeing some of the older houses now coming down big Big unit developments being built, a completely changing demographic as well. If you think about it, very often with these apartments, they're attracting a younger demographic, often the 20 to 30 year olds who don't care so much about those private schools anymore because they don't have kids to put into them anyway. Um, so we really do have to make sure that we examine these fundamentals well enough to be able to understand how they drive growth and look for the right, you're asking about the right kind of fundamentals, but I think you're doing it in a place that's already benefited from those things and has got a limited amount of additional benefit that it can get out of it from now. Keep looking though, I'm sure that you're on the verge of finding something really good. Well every now and then we get a question about Canberra and this week Amy asks, we're looking to buy in Canberra but there's been a lull of late due to APS jobs being cut, Australian Public Service jobs being cut, with it being Australia's capital city, do you think that it will remain stable? Brad, there's one thing about the Canberra market and that is that it's very predictable. Um, they have a 40% higher 
income in Canberra than anywhere else in Australia. So, and that's obviously with all the public service and the politicians' jobs up there pushing that up, which means they also have the most affordable housing. But they have somewhat of a perfect market. There's a pretty good balance between demand and supply there. Although of late in the city, there's a lot of apartments coming online. And, and we've done uh, on, uh, an amazing amount of depreciation schedules in Canberra over the last few years. And every time I go there, I see. Where, where do these people come from is sometimes what I think. But they, I guess we, we talked about how markets earlier in the, in the program about how markets move up and down with pricing over time, supply, demand. OK, we've pro there's a lot been built there in supply. Um, the, the fundamental reasons why areas grow and don't grow and, and grow too fast in Perth for a period of time. The one difference, I suppose, is Canberra has a bit of a changeover we, at now and then, but we know. It's, we have an election, and so we've got new people, and sometimes we get affected by the amount of um, cuts in the budgets and things like that in that area, because... Um, but we've got higher wages, so we've still got some ability to... It's probably just going to have a few more peaks and troughs based on that, because people have to move a bit more regularly, and, and it's, that market's impacted on that. But it's not necessarily impacted for a long time unless we really overbuild heaps and it goes ridiculous beyond where it should and then we'll have slow periods for some time. And Canberra's not had that necessarily, or it's had a bit of that, but it's going to, is it back at the spot it should be, I guess, is the important question. I mean, I think Canberra, the Canberra real estate um, market is one of the most boring markets in Australia <laughs> because nothing ever happens there, really. It goes up, but then wages go up and it goes up, and it very much is a wages linked economy yeah. and yeah. market there, isn't it? And, and as you mentioned, it's, they're the highest paid people in Australia, so that's a good floor price, I guess, for property prices. But look, I'm a bit bearish on Canberra. We've got um, quite a significant federal budget deficit. We've got a government is very keen to cut it back. A lot of their measures haven't got through, uh, particularly in terms of co-payments and education, so they're going to have to look back at where they're spending their money. Uh, they can't put higher taxes on us and high university fees, and that's the public service, and a lot of that's in Canberra. So I just think, look, it's going to just bob along um, and, you know, probably not have a significant downturn, but I just think the next couple of years uh, there's not a lot of in impetus there for any significant growth. Pretty safe market, but certainly nothing to write home about. Well, Gary is an avid viewer, and he he has a question from last week. He asks, I was just listening to Your Money, Your Call and I heard the presenter say that it was best to get advice from a qualified property investor, investment advisor. Can you explain what this qualification would be? Well, we can. We can In fact, tomorrow we have the, uh, the annual general meeting of the property investment professionals of Australia. So maybe you'd like to kick off the, the ball with um, a bit of an explanation about what a qualified property investment advisor is, Damien. Sure, Gary. So uh, Margaret and I are both on the board of the Property Investment Professionals of Australia, and that is an organisation dedicated to professionalism in the property investment industry. Unfortunately, the industry is not regulated, so as much as you need uh, a licence to give an advice on a $200 insurance policy, you can give advice on a million dollars of property and you don't need any licence. So uh, if someone's a member of uh, PIPA and they uh, obtain the qualified property investment advice, qualification means they've done a course of study which means that uh, we're comfortable that they're able to give you a professional property investment advice uh, also some other things that members of that association full disclosure of fees and charges so look I recommend if you're dealing with anybody make sure they're a qualified property investment advisor through PIPA and uh, certainly it'll give you confidence that you're dealing with someone who who should know what they're talking about and of course that whole disclosure thing is very important because Absolutely. all of our members must disclose their fees up front there's yep. no you know it's not that we're prescribing how much they can charge we're just saying whatever it is you do charge you give the investor yep. that opportunity to work out whether or not it's a value proposition for them yeah. And a lot of our members do charge fees up front, but for those who don't, those who get a commission, at least it's there fully disclosed. And you can go, well, does that make sense? If I'm paying 6 or 7 or 8 percent, that's, that's something you want to be wary of. So, yeah, absolutely, full disclosure. Absolutely. And for you, Brad, you're also a member of PIBA, um, and you're in the Associated uh, Services yes, sec so, sector. Yes, so we're BMT PIBA members, uh, and I think always dealing... Like, the, the idea of PIBA is to keep people honest, professional, and, and make sure that people are being given advice that in an unregulated industry has some sort of regulation. So what has the consumer got to lose out of that is the question. And it's most definitely nothing. Um, up front with your fees, like we're, we tell people what we charge up front with those things and, and, and so, should, so should anyone in the property industry be. There's some regulation around making sure that people aren't hiding things on fees. So 
I mean, it's hard to sometimes for people to make a decision on buying a property is when if there's been too much money put in there by too many people, you're going to end up overpaying and then that's taking a risk and losing money and it's a big decision for people, uh, so some transparency is, is only positive for the industry. Mm, absolutely. The and just to sum all of that up, if you're out there and you're deciding that you'd like to become a property investor or continue your portfolio, anybody that you deal with, ask them, are you a member of PIPA? We don't have big barriers to entry and the only barrier to entry is if they either don't want to subscribe to a code of conduct or don't want to disclose their fees to you. So if your advisor isn't a member of PIPA, suggest he become one or she become one as quickly as they possibly can. Well, time is running out and we need to take another quick break, but you might still be able to get your question answered and receive a copy of my book, How to Achieve Success in Property Negotiations. Call us now on 1330 3435 or also email us on property at skynews.com.au. Welcome back. It's been a great night with Brad Beer from BMT and Damien Collins from Momentum Wealth answering all of your calls and emails. Our lines are now closed, but during the week you can email your questions for next week to property at skynews.com.au. And we just have time for a couple of last emails which have come in. The first one from Lisa is for Brad, and she says, I have a depreciation report for my investment property which details prime cost and diminishing value methods. Which method would you recommend? recommend and why. I'm leaning towards the diminishing value method as it improves my deductions and cash flow now, enabling me to get into more investment properties sooner. And that's my sentiments exactly. Um, you might want to first of all explain the difference between diminishing value and prime cost. Yeah, it's probably a good start. Yeah. And uh, it's the two methods. But by don't which... bore everyone because yeah, yeah. it's pretty boring. <laughs> <laughs> two methods by which we claim depreciation against plant equipment on properties are diminishing value and prime cost. Now. Diminishing value effectively takes a percentage of each item uh, and, and claims it on a diminishing amount based on the residual value each year. Prime cost is half of the percentage and it gets the same amount each year but it's less because it's a lesser percentage and it spreads it out over time. Effectively what it does is level out the, the cash flow in, in, in prime cost and diminishing value claims faster up front. So I would agree with you as well, depending on your future cash flow situation, which you don't always know, if you don't need, if you don't have income to write off high deductions against this year and it's dragging you way down tax brackets and you're not going to take much advantage of it, then sometimes people will choose prime cost for that reason. But it's rare that you sit here going, I'm going to have no income this year and then a lots more in three years' time or four years' time and you need to spread it out that far. Money today is worth more than money next year or next year or next year. So get it in your pocket now wherever you can as much as possible, providing it's not a whole lot less. Mm. Um, you get to use it to put into offsets and reduce the interest you pay and, and yes, it's got the opportunity to get uh, potentially you into more property sooner. Although it is an important thing that you say that you do need to really try to understand what your financial circumstances are going to be like. It could be that you've got a property now that you've bought and then you might leave work and have a baby and go three years without income and then mm -hmm. plan to go back. Under those circumstances the prime cost method may work better Maybe for you. Maybe better. So it really comes down to you and what your expected future income. Whenever we do a depreciation schedule we give you both methods, we project it out for all that time. So if you know something that we don't know because we we're working what the depreciation number would be that in three years time your income is going to be something very different for some reason. You've got to look at that number each year and compare the two and see whether um, the extra up front is actually going to benefit you or based on some income situation you know in three years time look at what that means to you in dollars and see if it's going to be better then for you. Uh, Brad, when you do a split report where you give a report to two, two different owners, like yes. to individual owners, can one owner claim diminishing value while the other claims prime well, cost? The, the, in a split report, you're making your decisions. What you end up is really a percentage of the value of the item. So what you decide to do with that and what's best for you, um, it's a relevant prime cost emission value what the other one is doing because you're just claiming your percentage of the okay. item. Excellent. Michael from Brisbane, you're our last caller tonight. How can we help you? Oh, great. Hello, Margaret. I'm just wondering uh, what your preference and the panel's preference is on lenders' mortgage insurance mm. and whether you're inclined to, to pay the fee or the insurance 
uh, as opposed to uh, waiting until you saved up the cash or until you've had the equity grow in your existing properties? Mm. It's a good question. A lot of people often ask me whether or not they should be stumping up for that lender's mortgage insurance, which is essentially a lost premium. Um, and it's pretty well lost because you don't even get the benefit of the insurance. It's the lender who's getting the insurance, making you pay the premium. What do you think? Michael, it really comes down to what you're going to do with that money, what you're going to invest in. So look, in a perfect world, you'd say, look, I don't want to pay mortgage insurance. It's a couple of percent uh, when you get to 90 or 95 percent. And uh, it's, a lot, it's deductible over five years, which is a good thing. But it, as Margaret mentioned, it's a policy that insures a lender, doesn't insure you. And if you want to refinance during that time, uh, often you can't get your money back or you, you lose that. So look, if you think you're going to invest in a good growth area and it's going to get you in maybe two or three years sooner than you otherwise would, and you're going to pay a couple of percent, you might want to think about paying it um, but you want to be pretty confident because it is a, it's a fair bit of money and I guess it just depends really on the amount of money that we're talking about Brad I've seen mortgage insurance premiums for example my daughter's just bought a property at 90% and their premium was only three and a half thousand and it was definitely worth them getting in in fact they made that back before they settled mm -hmm. uh, I've seen mortgage insurance premiums for eighteen thousand dollars where it's a higher lend and a bigger loan amount and under those circumstances it's a big chunk out of your equity and I think that that, that is, a, is a perfect question. When I go through and refinance properties, and, I, and I, it's a bit hard based on lots of properties to get LMI because it makes the whole financing thing a little bit more difficult sometimes. There's one point to start with. Um, it depends on how much free equity you have and what are you going to use that money for. And whether you go 85, 90 or 95 will heavily impact on that amount of mortgage insurance and also will the total value. I've paid mortgage insurance a lot of times. Um, I, I would say that um, mortgage insurance is something that if I had have had that mentality earlier I probably would have made more money out of property at the start because I went and saved the money to get to the first one, didn't want to pay mortgage insurance but it's also riskier so you've got to consider that. It comes down to your personal risk profile, the risk to you. Sometimes I've paid it because I want to free up more cash so I can buy more property or be able to have the cash to renovate that property to do that but then that's a riskier strategy because you're leveraging up harder um, and it really comes down to some of the things personally that you can handle and where you know how well you can sleep based on that situation I suppose as well and how risky that is, is to you but then buying it leveraged me, doing it sometimes leveraged me into more property. Mm. And look, I'd just like to point out to you that it is crucial that you actually learn how to become a good investor first before you even think about this. Because the difference uh, for you could be that as an investor who's just buying anywhere based on a gut instinct, you could be spending mortgage insurance on a property that was never the right one to buy in the first place and then you are exacerbating the loss. If you are going to become a good savvy investor and get lots of education under your belt, beforehand then at least you might be buying a property that has a greater chance of being able to grow so that's the important thing before you even begin to think about whether you should be getting lenders mortgage insurance or not well that's all we have time for this week I will be back again next week as we officially start the run-up to Christmas and joining me is Brad Matthews from Rescom and Curtis Field from Colliers thank you to my guests this week Brad Beer from BMT and Damien Collins from Momentum Wealth you'll see them again very very soon thanks also to our callers if you could all now email me on your money your call at destiny.com.au it's on your screen I'll send you your ebook if you can tell me what your name was and what your question related to tonight so everyone who had a question read out on the show or answered on the show tonight is your night you get a copy of that book you can also follow me on Twitter Margaret Lomas are you and now on Instagram and this weekend the summer series of property success season six continues here on Sky News business tune in to see what I find on Saturday all day from 12 30 p.m. thanks for being with us I'll see you again next week the information featured in this program is general in nature and therefore should not be relied upon. Guests appearing on the program may have commercial arrangements with some of the companies mentioned. Before making any investment, insurance or financial planning decisions, you should consult a licensed professional who can advise whether your decision is appropriate for you.